percent of room for discussion. Today we are in collaboration with Dufas, which is a Dutch fund and asset management and asset management association. Today we will have two CEOs joining us, one of which is Eric van Houling. He's executive board member of Landschot uh, van Kempen, and he's also the CEO of Kempen Asset Management. Also with us today, we have Ronald Bouster, the CEO of um, APG Asset Management and executive board member at APG Group. They both invest in different ways for different clients. Think about individuals and think about uh, institutions. Asset management is generally a branch of finance that deals with managing the wealth of wealthy individuals and institutions and doing, that, doing this with the long term in mind. Today, uh, people at our stage today are representing two companies that deal with it in quite different ways. In quite different ways. Van Lanschot Kempe focuses more specifically on wealthy individuals and small institutions. And APG Asset Management, led by Ronald uh, Reusser, uh, manages the pension funds for over 5 million individuals. And today we'll be talking about many different things. What is asset management? How do you break into asset management? And also some of the daily dilemmas that the CEOs struggle on a, that the, that the CEOs struggle with on a daily basis. We will now start with the interview that will also offer plenty of room for audience questions. But importantly, we will have a bottle later at Cafe Crater, sponsored by Dufas, where you can continue to ask your questions um, to the two CEOs. For now, please welcome to the stage Erik van Houwelinge and Ronald Baster. <laughs> So, welcome to Room for Discussion. Let's jump straight into it. What are some of the most common misconceptions about asset management? Would you like to take the lead, Eric? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think, can you hear me all right or not? No? No. Is the Try again? That's, yeah, I think Perfect. it works. That's yeah. better, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the more popular misconceptions is uh, that we're only in it for our own benefit, um, which, uh, you know, I, th I think is clearly not the case. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a stigma uh, that finance in general, but definitely also asset managers have to deal with. So just in it for the money you're saying, Ronald, what do you think some misconceptions are in asset management or about asset management? Also? About about asset management, um, that it's too complicated for uh, to enter into. Uh, so that, that it's highly risky, that it's something that you need to avoid, that it's not something that everyone should consider. And, and that's not true, eh? because asset management it is part of many products in, in everyone's life. Uh, so insurance products, uh, banking products, pension products. And actually, of course, there's very complicated structures, but there's also relatively simple uh, structures. And, and I think one of the disadvantages maybe of this country, the Netherlands, is that we have a savings culture uh, that doesn't return a lot. Uh, it does return something, but I think you can uh, get higher returns if you start into investing. And uh, in a previous interview, you mentioned, Ronald, that uh, you actually wanted to become an astronaut. And uh, Sorry, Anna. that you wanted to become an astronaut. Oh, an astronaut, yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could you then tell uh, us, uh, what was it that changed your mind and uh, 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 led you to asset management? I wasn't smart enough to uh, <laughs> finish the... <laughs> uh, I, yeah, it, true, when I was young, what I, do, what I did, I tried to uh, design uh, spaceships. Uh, and I really was sort of, uh, it was part of what I, I liked, and I thought, well, maybe the new worlds to, to discover could be uh, lying outside of planet Earth. <laughs> so it really had a charm. And I still, some uh, so this is this is private confession, sometimes when I try to get into sleep at night, I still sort of imagine that what if I would uh, step into my spaceship and would uh, go into uh, into space. Uh, so yes, and what changed my mind? I don't. I, I probably I I do have a quantitative uh, background, and I'm relatively good at uh, at math. But but well, I, in in the end, the sort of gamma studies were closer to my heart than the beta, the solid beta studies. So I think that that was what changed my mind. Yeah. 
And you, Eric, did you leave behind any dreams that you still dream about? <laughs> I say to Ronald, uh, keep on dreaming. <laughs> and, uh, it's never too late uh, yeah. to, to chase uh, a new dream, I think. Um, no, I always wanted to be a farmer. Uh, so it's very, very different than uh, Ronald's ambition. And um, I actually bought a farm a couple of years ago. And uh, I consider myself now a hobby farmer, but, uh, you know, slowly but surely making some uh, some progress. And we do it in a regenerative way, by the way. So, you know, without any pesticides and, and, and what have you. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, the beginning maybe of a new career. We'll, okay. yeah, we'll it's see. Yeah, it's yeah. true that with uh, working up a career in finance, you are able to still pursue your hobbies. Yeah. So mm. Very nice to yeah. hear. <laughs> so we already know what you probably do when you go to pension. Um, let's turn to the audience, kind of see who's here. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're certainly currently studying economics or finance at the UVA? Most, okay. most people. Okay, that is not a lot of diversity. But yeah. <laughs> well, and mm. uh, who of you is looking for a job in economics or finance? Okay, that's also a lot of you. Yeah. Yeah. And to get to know a little bit behind your motivations, behind your uh, career choice, um, I would like you all to be honest with me now. Who's in it for the money? Okay, some honest points. Yeah. Okay, so who here saw the, you know, who here wants to have a job in finance because they got inspired by Wolf of Wall Street? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really hope we wouldn't see any hands on that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So good, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> so finance is pretty broad. We have people in asset management in front of us. Who here specifically came here because they're interested in asset management? Okay, wow. Great. Let's see. Good Can you job. keep your hand raised uh, if you want to answer why you're inter interested in asset management? We will get a microphone to you. Let's see. I see two people. Um, we can do both. The person in the back, you can give the microphone, and then the person in the front afterwards. I like the idea of uh, lower volatility, just the growth of assets, as opposed to more higher volatility things like trading. Okay, that's a uh, brief, but well, makes a lot of sense. We also have a gentleman in front. Yeah, um, so I got inspired at least uh, at home by my dad, and I think uh, it's one of the, well, one of the best and greatest jobs in finance. So I think that's uh, a little bit what got me inspired to come here today. Good. Okay. Thank you for sharing. And uh, who is still doubting a little bit about uh, starting up a career in asset management? Yeah, we have uh, someone over there, the far edge, the brunette. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, well, I mean, you never know, right? Um, I think there's a lot of aspects that I can't account for. You know, there's an element of naivety, um, especially being so young. Um, and so that's why I come to these things to try and learn a bit more and See if, uh, see if it's right for me. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I hope that uh, during the next hour we can resolve some doubts. Does anybody else have some doubts that they would definitely like to get answers to today? The gentleman here in the front. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm persistent enough to uh, deal with the pressure of dealing with such large amount of money, so. That sense of doubting, uh, doubting the estimation part. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, to reveal a little bit, we already discussed uh, before this interview that uh, you see a little bit less interest than you used to in asset management. How does it feel now to see so many students here that do want to have uh, a relief? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good, good to see all this. In, and and I must admit, I did not really research this interest but this is something that we well, sort of sense has so when, when uh, Eric and I are of a similar age and I think when we left university uh, particularly in certain studies I think almost everybody wanted to go either to corporate finance or to asset management and these days uh, there's a lot of um, my child one of my children is uh, 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 studying economics as well and I hardly ever hear her or her friends talk about asset management so maybe that's creating an impression and we feel that we need lots of young talent uh, uh, to well um, enter into this uh, this beautiful mm -hmm. sector and to inspire us with new ideas and uh, new setups and new products 
Yeah, I think I'm uh, picking up on uh, what you just said. Uh, you were inspired by your dad. I was inspired by my grandfather, uh, who tried to make sense of financial markets, you know, and just reading every day in the news, uh, uh, like in the financial uh, uh, Dag Blatt, uh, you know, on, on, on movements, the economy, and, 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 you know, try to make some sense out of that. And, uh, you know, if you're good, to translate that into actual investing uh, and put your money where your mouth is, in a way. And to do that in a, in a sensible uh, way uh, that, you know, continues to generate, obviously, a return. And that's what captured me very, very early on. Uh, I think I must have been around 14 or 15 that I developed an interest in that as well. And that has never left. So if that's the kind of stuff that you like, uh, and then there's many different type of jobs around that, of course, uh, then, yeah, that's, that's something that asset management definitely can offer. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about what are some misconceptions about asset management, uh, who would like to go into asset management, but what really is asset management? Yeah, to me, it uh, breaks down in, into basically two things. Um, you know, as, as an asset manager, uh, we do not invest our own money, right? Let's start there. We invest our money on behalf of others, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, wealthy individuals uh, or participants in, the, in a pension fund, um, you know, that doesn't really matter. They all have certain needs, and usually uh, that is around capital preservation and to make a return. Uh, and uh, how you do that in a smart way, uh, that's where asset management comes in, right? And you can do that yourself, uh, you know, by having a brokerage account and pick your own stocks or, 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 or funds or whatever, um, you know, or you can kind of leave it to the pros. Uh, to the asset managers that have thought about that and have generated, obviously, knowledge uh, in order to do that. Um, and the second part, I think, uh, is is on uh, making those returns um, and exactly, you know, how you do that. You know, we have, uh, just like, uh, obviously, Ronald's organization has, uh, we have our own investment teams, uh, and they do not only advise on how to construct a portfolio, but they actually invest in individual stocks, for example. And how do you do that? You know, what kind of strategy do you have? Uh, and basically the name of the game there is to outsmart the other guy, right? Because if you don't and if you can't, then, you know, it's best maybe to uh, invest in a passive strategy. So uh, that's kind of how it breaks down. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would you build it just to say what is the role of uh, asset management in today's world? We've seen the pandemic and mm -hmm. cost of living crisis now, loads of wars yeah. going on everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, there's input and output, huh? so uh, Eric uh, talked uh, a bit about both, uh, but particularly about uh, investing other people's money and, and making returns. But I think uh, another element is that, that you're trying to uh, steer, influence, make possible, uh, put uh, oil into the system in a way of things functioning. Uh, and, and that's the role of an asset manager as well. In today's world, I think many asset managers want to create value at least, or probably many even want to create impact, meaning that you want to affect people's life positively by reducing negative uh, effects as well. Uh, but, but also as a young portfolio manager and uh, try to make sense of the... the uh, making money and, and doing good things. Huh? So that's sort of, uh, I is it necessary a trade-off? Well, not necessary because uh, you can also, by steer steering those asset flows and uh, harvesting good returns, can also have a positive influence on the world. And of course, everybody has his or her opinion about what that positive could be. And of course, you always respect the... Uh, goals of your clients, but you can steer those money flows into certain directions. And, and that, that, it, that is how it affects today's world, I think, in a way. And in that sense, you're, well, there is, the, of course, you're, as one firm, only have limited influence, but we cooperate a lot with other parties, and then eventually the influence can grow and grow, and you can have an effect on the world. So you mentioned money flows. Uh, where does the money flow? What kind of assets do you guys actually have in your portfolio? Would you like to take the charge, Eric? Yeah, well, there's no easy answer there because it's all over the place. Um, you know, I mean, the easiest one, obviously, uh, are listed equities or bonds. You know, we kind of all know that it's part of your 
finance class uh, valuation and everything else. Uh, it's very transparent. Um, but, you know, we go uh, deep into uh, sub-asset classes where, you know, there's no liquidity, no listing. Uh, we just, as an example, um, and this is also why it's a little bit close to my heart, that we have a regenerative farming uh, fund at Van Lanschot Kempen. Um, now around half a billion, just to give you some idea, that where we invest directly in uh, farmland uh, operations uh, throughout the world. So maybe in, a, in an olive yard in, uh, in Portugal or in, in uh, New Zealand, uh, we, have a, we have a couple of places. So, um, you know, it can, it can be that specific as well. Uh, so uh, it's, it's by far, same thing goes for, for APG, uh, beyond uh, the, the, the kind of thing that we know as listed equities or, or listed. Yeah. Maybe to mention a couple of exotic <coughs> ones, uh, we invested or invest in CSI uh, series, in, uh, in cat bones, in uh, Britney Spears uh, music <laughs> rights, in uh, farmland, in vineyards. Uh, so, so that's also, and that's that's of course the outliers. I, I don't want to give you the impression this is this is the mainstream. But those those outliers, we do invest in as well, or did invest in. And the, the game is still the same, right? <laughs> I mean, you have to do proper valuation. You look at what it's worth and what the projected worth is, discount it somehow, and then you see if it's an attractive investment. Often diversification plays an important role, uh, like some of the examples that Ronald just mentioned, uh, they have uh, diversification purposes because they're not correlated, for example, as much to uh, to the stock market uh, and are, as a, you know, in that sense, also very, very interested or interesting, I should say, for investors. So, as you mentioned, the money kind of flows all over the world. You go to New Zealand, mm -hmm. you go to Portugal, yep. maybe you're sitting behind the desk and you think Britney Spears is very interesting and you send some money there. Like, how does it come on your radar? Like, like how do these things actually mm -hmm. come out? Or come on the radar for you to invest. Yeah, yeah. also in many different ways. As some of the uh, areas we invest in are well researched. Yeah? Eric was talking about listed equities and particularly the large caps and particularly large caps uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, it, if you're not careful, you can receive your mailbox full of research on those stocks every day. Uh, and the more exotic thing, sometimes you need to uh, source and develop yourself. Huh? So uh, I uh, <coughs> start uh, at one point in time, I started to visit Philips and, and talked about uh, trying to uh, invest in their unused patent portfolio. So I, I went there, say, well, uh, you have so many patents. Uh, is part of that available and, and could we buy it and could we invest in it? It, it never materialized, uh, but, but those as sometimes you source it yourself and sometimes there's intermediates, uh, people that are working in certain markets. And for certain assets, you need to be, to have what we call uh, boots on the ground, so be nearby. And like the example I gave about listed equities, well, you can sit everywhere. You can sit on, uh, on Antarctica and then, uh, manage your portfolio of, of U.S. equities. So it also very much depends. Mm. Yeah. Our, our, our job is uh, for an organization uh, to be better ready to have kind of the, the, the breath, uh, you know, to deal with all of these different uh, possibilities that you have in investing. Um, it's not like at the end of the day, uh, we look at a proposal and then we decide to go left or right, right? I mean, we don't have that expertise, but we do have teams that possess that expertise. And in the case of APG, but also same at Van Lanschot Kempen, we're talking about hundreds of people. Because if you're a specialist in a uh, large cap, for example, uh, usually that is in, the, in, a, in a particular industry, and so it's that specific, then uh, the, you know there's no chance uh, that you also understand how to deal with private equity or uh, with cap bonds. I mean, that would be, it's an entirely different different angle to, uh, to invest in. Uh, so those are professionals, specialists. Uh, it's usually usually a career path, um, and it's our job to to, to orchestrate that. Mm. And how do you then see the difference between the kinds of assets you have in your portfolio? How do you evaluate what's good and what is not good? Is it something that is based on just its performance, or do you take into mind what your clients are interested in? Uh, we t we tend to look at uh, at at four categories. Uh, the the best known is risk and return. 
Uh, so certain things are high risk and then you expect high return as well. But we also look at the cost of managing something. Uh, so private equity could be very popular and, and it is and it did until uh, this year offer very good returns, but it's also expensive to invest in that. So cost is a con consideration. And then uh, number four is uh, uh, sustainability. And uh, so what how does it relate to uh, not only good investment returns, but also to a better world? So those are the four main categories, but you could split that up into many more factors that are underlying that. Yeah, sorry. And uh, Eric, you specifically work also with uh, wealthy individuals. How much uh, do your clients then have a say in what specific assets uh, are invested in? Um, well, that depends on the very specific arrangement that we have. Um, I mean, many clients actually kind of, you know, they they all need goals, right? I mean, you need to understand what somebody's goal is uh, and what the length is, the horizon, how much uh, risk uh, you're willing to take. Uh, that's, so that's always start one of the process, um, you know, the beginning. Um, but, you know, then after that, uh, it can break down into uh, basically two different different angles. One uh, is where we actually uh, invest for them um, and we take control of the portfolio. Um, yeah, so that's that could be in a managed account or through funds. And the other one uh, is through an adv advisory arrangement. So the client at the end of the day decides themselves uh, and we come in and we make proposals. So. Yeah, and uh, at APG, of course, you work with pension funds. So there, the kind of mm. investment strategies that you have are impacted by more than just the market, but also government regulation. Now with mm. the new regulation coming in for pension, how does this change your investment strategy? Was this something that uh, you have been accounting for? Um, how do you build investment strategies generally that withstand this government change? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, the interesting thing about um, uh, pension investing, which could also be true for other uh, kinds of investment, but it's particular for pension funds that you manage against liabilities. Uh, so you need to pay out uh, pensions at a certain point in time. And at that time, people like to see a certain cash flow. Uh, so you, you take that into account and you're asking, is the new system changing that? And uh, the answer is slightly, uh, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have a big impact. Uh, it is changing the asset mix a little bit because the regulatory penalty, I would almost say the risk that you need to take into account for certain asset class change a little bit. That's why it makes it slightly more attractive to uh, invest in private assets compared to capital market assets. They used to have a higher risk attached to it and that, that's, that's disappearing. And uh, pension funds hatch certain exposures and one of the expo most important one is uh, interest rate. Uh, because to pay uh, out an annuity, uh, you need, of course, to discount at grade your cash flow and discount it by the interest rate. And that's why pension funds hatch that exposure to a certain extent. And that's also slightly changing in the new system. So uh, interest rate hatching is still an element, but it's less important. And the funny thing is, and this is technical, I really, I hope everyone, uh, the, the funny thing is in the run up to the new system, pension funds are hedging more interest rates risk to be sure that they have the appropriate coverage ratio to move to the new system. And the expectation is that after the transition, they will gradually reduce some of that interest rate hedging. So this is, uh, this is a, a, yeah. a, a difference, yeah. Do you think that the new regulation is something that benefits people in general? I think it makes it more explicit. Uh, so it what what the big uh, gain is, I hope, is that I, I believe that, that people, if, if you're able to, should invest. Uh, so I like savings as well, but I think it would be better if we could build uh, for capital markets, capital build-up orientation in Europe. And I think this, of course, Eric's uh, firm invests a lot about for rich individuals, but, but uh, pension funds invest for your average 
person and to make those people aware that you are actually uh, uh, benefiting from investing in financial market, that's a good thing. And that is, for me, probably the most positive element of uh, the new system, where people are becoming aware of that, and that could lead to better uh, understanding and probably doing more of that. Uh, it's still a good system. Uh, so the Mercer study said, it's a good system already in the Netherlands, and it will continue to be a good system that I also believe in. A uh, slight disadvantage is that the new system is rather complex to understand. So uh, the old system was complex, but this may be even more complex. Mm. All right. So it is very important, I think, generally to understand the value then of money and this new system as expanding it. I think generally with asset management, a lot of people might have the question, why you then want to have your money managed by someone else rather than do it yourself? What would you say, Eric, is the reason why a person would rather have their asset managed by someone else rather than just putting it in, let's say, S&P 500? Well, I, I think it basically has uh, two reasons. I mean, uh, number one is uh, competence. Um, do you really believe that you have uh, the ability to, you know, with everything that is going on in the world all the time, make the right decisions in order to construct uh, a decent investment portfolio? Um, I don't think many people will be able to answer that with a yes. That's a little bit different than uh, having a little bit of play money uh, and buying selective stocks uh, because you like to gamble a little bit. Yeah? Uh, but to do that in a professional manner uh, with where also the risks are contained and where you can kind of take the idea uh, that in the longer run, uh, you know, you'll be adding uh, returns and thus the value um, of whatever the amount of money is that you have. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a little amount or a small amount. And the second one is time. You know, even if you were able to do that, uh, it's going to be very, very intensive. I mean... I don't. I would not know how you could do that and have a day job at the same time, right? So, um, for a lot of people, uh, and this is also why, for example, advice is very popular. You know, people uh, like to still be in control, but in most cases, you know, they will follow the advice that we give them. Not always, but in most cases, they will. Um, maybe I can add that it's it's access also. <laughs> huh? So if you if you can mobilize access and bargaining power, those are things you will probably. Uh, learn here as well. Huh? So you, uh, if if you are able to uh, mobilize big volumes of something, so uh, more assets, then uh, then you are in a better bargaining position. So y your costs are lower, and you have better access to things. That could also be a reason. But that could be if if you're uh, you have a lot of assets yourself, and you have a lot of time. Uh, and you have a, a lot of skill and you like to do it, yeah, of course you can also do it yourself. Uh, so I can probably do certain things to build a house, but I'm happy that there's <laughs> other, <laughs> other people doing those things mm -hmm. probably better and have more time to do so. And the same holds true, I think, for asset management. So it kind of feels like the bottom line is investing uh, in asset management is just a responsible way of investing your money. I must be noted that a lot of money is currently going to, towards private equity, also in both of your portfolios. Yep. Can you kind of tell me what private equity is to the audience, like I'm sure you guys know, uh, but kind of explain very briefly, and also tell me what the role of private equity is in your portfolios. Mm -hmm. Who would like to start off? Uh, pri uh, the, 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 the position has, so um, of pension funds, more and more gets invested in what we call private Assets, private equity is one of those. Also, uh, big others, uh, other categories are real estate and, and infrastructure to a certain extent. Uh, land investment. What is private equity? Well, uh, simply put, I think it's the uh, non-listed equity alternative. So it's it's like uh, investing in uh, equity of a company. So not that, but an equity of a company outside of the listed environment. In reality, I think it's important what value are you creating by private equity? And there, I think there's a big difference and there's also different approaches. I think uh, private equity sort of gains somewhat negative publicity by doing one of those elements, that's financial engineering. So you could increase uh, return capacity of an investment by uh, refinancing companies. 
Uh, I think it helps to a certain extent, but we try to focus on the other side, and that is improving value creation. And what uh, private equity does with companies, particularly companies in a growth phase, because there is most value creation happening. Venture capital is interesting, but also risky. Uh, uh, large buyouts are often, to a, to a certain extent, financial engineering. Uh, Mid-market scale-up is, is creating value by combining ideas, uh, uh, creating skill, entering new markets, uh, improving management, improving structures, and that's more hands-on usually uh, than with listed, where, where of course uh, it's relatively much in the open and as an investor you judge the reports but you're less involved with, uh, with the value creation. Mm. So the takeaway is that you guys, when you do private equity for your companies, you do it in a responsible way, but you also acknowledge that private equity is getting like a, uh, a perception of this thing where it's just a money grab, but you're saying that we don't do that. I have, you can do private equity in a responsible way uh, because the assignments you can give to the managers of private equity can include certain terms in which you uh, uh, force them into doing responsible things. There is, I think, an interesting debate. Is that too much uh, money being earned by the people that deliver the good results. And, and one side of that uh, answer to that question is no, because they're offering the great results and they're doing a lot for it, so they're able to benefit. Uh, the other side is, yeah, but if uh, the other party would not make a, available such amounts of capital, they would not be in a position to uh, earn so much money and it's not really fair. How do we handle it? Uh, we uh, accept the market in a way, but we also try to force the market into more, what we feel more realistic, reasonable levels. So we put pressure on fees, we negotiate very hard, we try to push the markets downward a bit, and at the same time we do uh, need to accept that this is a sector in which, uh, well, uh, good returns are made also for the, for the partners in the private equity firms. Mm -hmm. So this, this is often uh, one of the dilemmas that we just have to deal with. Uh, because on the one hand, and especially here in the Netherlands, you know, where we don't like big bonuses and, uh, you know, we think that it's stealing from. Um, yeah, and it, uh, to some extent, uh, that's sometimes true. Uh, but if the alternative is not to invest in the asset class and to forego an opportunity, then yeah, uh, uh, who, are, who are you serving, right? So, uh, and I think in many cases, you know, we would also take the same stance uh, as Ronald says, okay, you know, we accept that this is just the cost of doing business while trying to do something about it, uh, instead of just staying out of that corner of the market, because that's expensive in a way as well. You forgo an opportunity. So, so maybe to dig into this a bit deeper, the bonus both of you kind of mentioned, yeah, it kind of feels uh, not wrong, but you know, you talk about big bonuses, like people earning over a million euros that work in private equity. Do you think that this is kind of a Dutch culture where you kind of, uh, uh, like in America, it's kind of more accepted, it feels like, and here you guys are both kind of going like, I can understand how it looks. Do you think that's a particular European or Dutch way of thinking? Yeah, I think it's very, it's very Dutch. Um, and, you know, I don't see that uh, we, we, we have a, an office in the UK as well. Uh, I lived in the US for a long time. It doesn't exist, uh, you know, the kind of dilemmas and the, the kind of things uh, on compensation that we deal with. I mean, if you look at, uh, and we're not complaining about this, right? But uh, we are also, as an industry, under a bonus cap. That's just a fact of our lives. Uh, but it also makes it more difficult, for, for example, to attract international talent and talent uh, that has as an opportunity. Uh, maybe London or New York or any other place, um, and it's just it's just what it is, right? So uh, we we deal with it, but uh, yeah, it is I think something very particular Dutch. Okay, so there's a lot of bonuses. Well, that's a bit unfair to say, but you can get a very good bonus if you uh, work in uh, asset management. Do we have any audience questions yeah. as it stands? Quite a few. Got this one in the middle on the my left side.
Yeah, hello. Um, what role uh, does crypto have in your portfolio? That, uh, for us, no, no, no role. We don't invest in crypto. And and there's a reason. I, 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 I tell you the reason. It's we believe it doesn't offer a long-term value, uh, and that's not to say it could not be a, a great investment. Huh? So there's there's many investments now. You could try to buy something low and sell it high, which we call speculative. But but I in itself I think speculative is not a problem. Uh, that many people became very rich by speculation in a way. So I would, I'm, I'm not arguing necessarily against crypto. It's not our investment style. Uh, it, it because it doesn't give you cash flow returns from the investment itself. Recently, it entered into the market with some institutional investors, like gold did. It, it is sort of a hedge against adverse circumstances in financial markets. You could say, well, if the overall market climate sells down, uh, yeah, is negative, negative. Uh, this could be a bit of a hedge. I think it works to a certain extent for gold. Early research uh, suggests actually it doesn't really work for crypto because it is sort of fed by the same capital flows as lead uh, uh, the flows that lead this market to correct or not to correct. Yeah. Any cryptos in your portfolio? Yes, uh, but uh, it's an asset class that we really don't understand um, and are building some kind of an understanding. And before we, um, we, I mean, if we don't, then uh, it's not something that we will invest in or offer. Um, on the advice side that I just explained, we do facilitate for our clients if they want to invest in cryptos. But it's not something that we would advise on or have a particular opinion on simply because, you know, we don't understand. And I know that's a little bit black and white, but at the end, that's the conclusion. Do, do you have a growing amount of clients coming to you and saying, hey, this crypto thing, I oh know a nephew that got very rich with it. Can you guys do something with crypto? Do you see like a trend? Yeah, well, I, I know those nephews as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, if they do really well, then they become a client maybe. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's undoubtedly the fact that there's people there that have made uh, a lot of money, right? By investing and being early in the game. It's not the question. I mean, the question, is it luck or is it skill? Yeah. And um, yeah, if as long as we don't, are, or as long as we are not able to answer that question, uh, we stay away and you know good for them right um yeah uh, any more questions uh gentlemen in front uh yeah so how do you think the role of analysts will uh, change in the coming years with the rise of uh, artificial intelligence and such yeah it's already changing yeah and it's changing really quick um, and in a way, I think it's scary. I know uh, Ronald has a more balanced opinion on this, so he can uh, he can add later. Uh, because I think that, you know, if you kind of project into the future, right now the answer is pretty simple, right? You know, they can do, uh, you know, through AI and with the use of AI, uh, do all kinds of tasks that would usually take a long, long time for an analyst and uh, for an analyst to figure out, right? Going into the research, uh, you know, reading the annual reports, everything that is necessary in order to build up an investment case. And once you have an investment case, it goes uh, through you know, some kind of a, a process where it's, it's, it's weighted in terms of is it a good idea or is it not a good idea. Um, and that's, that's here today. And it has, um, has up to this point also um, a massive efficiency component attached to it. You know, so um, in, in my practice, an in investment case, so it's once you decide to kind of look at a certain stock, um, you know, the, the, the time has been reduced by 70%. Um, it's that much, eh? because it's a lot of digging that you have to do or had to do, and now all of a sudden you need to make sure that all of the required documents are there, and, um, you know, the sophistication is there through the iteration. So, in other words, it's already working quite well. Um, then, you know, the judgment, the human judgment obviously still is very, very important. The question is, is that still the case five years from now or ten years from now? Um, and, you know, my gut feel says yes. 
Um, but that's also maybe because we're trained that way. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it will push us to the boundaries uh, also for not only the analyst roles, but also the portfolio man manager roles. Um, and in addition, you'll see different different kind of trading spends. Uh, so now you have uh, a lot of quant shops uh, that you know are basically algorithms, right? But they're al algorithms based on, for example, stock price data, <laughs> and they look at a anomaly, and you know you get a trading strategy that hopefully works. Um, yeah, now all of a sudden uh, there's a lot more that will enter into that field as well. So uh, those are exciting times, right? Even though we don't know the answers, but uh, yeah. Now, I, 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 it's both very interesting and scary in a way. Um, you see, the, uh, I think let's tell a bit about quant investing uh, and the development there. Uh, so uh, we had an area in which we uh, were looking for factors that were identifiable, uh, economic factors that, that could relate to returns. But after a certain amount of time, and there were warnings that this would happen, but, but the industry said, no, there will never be that much of a flow to arbitrage away those factors, but actually it, it happened. And the new quant approaches that we entered after that were more AI b uh, based, so less systematic, and those became successful again. So there's definitely something in AI in identifying uh, strategies that are uh, good in terms of, of return. And yes, what Eric is saying, handling, uh, capa uh, capacity handling, efficiency is a big factor. Uh, the trade-off between men and data or approaches, algorithms is always difficult. I, I remember that at uh, uh, the company I started as a portfolio manager, we were at one point in time less satisfied with the human uh, ability to uh, uh, outperform benchmarks. And then uh, we said, uh, okay, we will introduce algorithms and and so we did we programmed algorithms and actually did well for quite some time and then we said well maybe we should enter uh, the human factor again and then we can become better and at that point in time actually the algorithms started to fail. this what what happened is was the human was uh, able to destroy the value of the algorithm uh, and why do I tell you this story? Because usually you, you would hear that the combination of man and data and machine is the best possible combination. And I still tend to believe that it is in a way, but this is an example where, where it didn't work, where actually the involvement of human research, human skills, sort of destroyed the value added completely. And you needed to go back to the full machine-based approach to uh, to get the great returns. And that is scary in a way because uh, it's uh, why do we want uh, a, a pilot in the cockpit of an aircraft? Uh, so we, it, it gives us a, 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 a sense of security that there is a human still there looking at what is happening and able to correct. But sometimes I, I also, some of watch air crash investigation. You see that many of the mistakes are because of the interaction between the pilot and uh, the autopilot. So it, it's a very difficult question to answer. And in that sense, it requires a lot of thinking and research. And the application of AI, I think we should not stop, but yes, definitely think very well about. So let's not. Uh, go in on a route that we th let things go ahead of us before we have really thought, uh, thought well about it. Perfect. Just curious for myself, who here studies AI? Raise your hand. Someone in the back, perfect. Uh, let's do one more question, a short question. A gentleman in the back here. How are you prepared for a possible recession? <laughs> short question. <laughs> do you expect one? <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. Maybe we can make the question first, then, do you expect a recession? Uh, I, I do not really expect a recession, but... Thank I've you, I do, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> no, neither do I. But if we both agree, then it's probably coming, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
but you're not I, I think how do we we, prepare, we do not prepare for a recession as such what we do prepare for is different circumstances uh, so what 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 we do as asset managers we usually look at different scenarios and there's always uh, a recession scenario in there it's sometimes called different but but that, there's always a recession scenario so we see how well is our portfolio able to handle that recession it's never a hundred percent bet so we'll never say well now we expect a recession so we're going to be very defensive in our portfolio <coughs> because we know <coughs> and, and that's true for every one of us here we are not very good at forecasting those <coughs> economic uh, circumstances uh, so the way we handle it is is, is diversification. Uh, even that we know at today's research shows that maybe you only benefit from uh, a limited amount of all the assets that you invest in, but nobody knows who the, uh, what those assets are. So you still need to diversify uh, to a, a, a large extent. So that's how we handle it, I think. For both of us, uh, just to make that clear, and I think it goes for, not for the whole asset management industry, but uh, we we are long-term investors. Our companies are uh, long-term investing companies. Uh, because in Ronald's case, uh, you're talking about, um, you know, people that, you know, still have 30 years to work before they pension and before they get uh, their benefits. Uh, in our case, it's basically the same. You know, people have long-term goals. You know, they want to make sure uh, you know, that they still have uh, uh, money to spend uh, around retirement or stuff like that. So it means that you have to go through cycles. You know, there will always be, uh, um, you know, downtimes and uptimes. Uh, and we, we have been in, in, in quite a favorable, well, you can argue COVID, but, you know, there was a rapid response as well. Uh, but, you know, the, there has not been uh, a significant downtime in, in, in the last couple of years. So that makes you more alert, uh, but the portfolio that you're constructing needs to be weatherproof in all circumstances. Eh? And that's where it gets back to kind of concepts that Ronald is mentioning, like, you know, proper diversification. Um, and diversification, you can go into many, many different angles, right? It can be geographical, in asset classes, uh, in, in, in return characteristics. That's why they end up with uh, catastrophe bonds, for example. Perfect. Thank everyone for your questions. There will be more room for questions uh, a bit further on. So taking a step back, be very direct. What do you guys actually do as CEOs? And also, can you combine it with, uh, you both have families, can you combine it with your family? Well, the last question, um, people would disagree on that, you know, because uh, yes, we work hard. Um, and I, we, we, we know each other, right? So I can uh, sometimes speak for Ronald as well a little bit. But, um, you know, I mean, if you're CEO of an organization and um, if you're looking at financial markets, there's always something going on. There's always something that requires a response. So it's a busy job. Uh, so we work uh, quite a few hours in a week. Uh, and I always have, you know, I've been doing this for more than 30 years. Um, it's what I like. It's what I'm used to. Um, you know, some people may have an opinion about that. I have a family with uh, three daughters. Uh, they're now in their early 20s. Um, you know, I think I spend enough time at home. And, uh, you know, with my wife, I uh, have raised three three kids in a way that is responsible and pretty good and feels good. So, uh, but others uh, will probably judge uh, that that is kind of a work-life balance that they would like to do a little bit different, you know, and that's just a choice that you have to make. Um, and, you know, I don't value uh, either the left or the right side of that spectrum. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's just the way it is for, for me. Mm. Uh, you also asked what, what do we do? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, I avoided that uh, question. Uh, yeah. and, and <laughs> I think I, I had some time to think about it. Uh, so I, I was tempted to say we don't do a lot, but that <laughs> well, would not be. I think what we do is we... Uh, uh, come up with a, a vision, a strategy, uh, a, the concepts, and then arbitrage, uh, after we've done that, arbitrage between many people and, and make ultimate decisions. Uh, so 
and then related back to to, uh, to Eric's answer, uh, can you have a family? In a way, um, of course, huh, I have a family, uh, but you also work 24 hours a day. So uh, at the strangest time, and, uh, and, and uh, probably I, I left my phone uh, in the room, but oh. many people will have asked me a, a, a question making a decision, and that can happen at night as well. But there's also times that I am flexible and more flexible than others because I don't need to produce. Uh, it's not production work when I... Uh, wake up uh, sometimes in the morning and a meeting is cancelled, I could say, well, I go and run for a couple of hours <laughs> and then see. Uh, so there's flex uh, flexibility in one way, but there's also never real time off uh, because there always is the uh, possibility that someone asks you uh, a question about, make please, we are not able to find a solution or a decision here. Please, can you make that decision for us? Uh, that's, I think, what we do a lot. Where we are a little bit different is uh, that Van Lanschot Kemp is a commercial organization, and obviously, uh, as you probably know, also a listed organization. Uh, so, you know, I do spend a lot of my time uh, with clients, just understanding uh, what their questions are, you know, having a, a dialogue like we're having right here. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, in make many, many cases, I need to bring specialists. I don't know all of the answers. Uh, but, you know, to make sure that we offer them a service that is of value to them, um, you know, because like we said earlier, you know, this is who we are and what we can offer to individuals or to institutions. Uh, but you have to earn that every day, right? Just like uh, well, with other things in life. So, Let's talk a little bit also about generally the type of people in asset management. Yeah. What qualifications does one need to start up in asset management? What is a desirable profile, so to say? I think it has changed over time um, where, you know, maybe in the past uh, you needed to study econometrics or economics or maybe finance. Uh, that has changed. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the background now of people, uh, you know, entering uh, our organization or others, um, it's not unusual uh, for them to have studied sociology or something where you think, okay, how does that work? Um, but, um, you know, increasingly we're looking for, for competencies and not necessarily, uh, you know, where you have studied and what you have studied. Um, the type of roles and jobs that have emerged have changed as well. Uh, because, yes, there was the question here on the analyst. I think that that's pretty well defined. Um, the chance entering with a socio sociology degree for an analyst job is not that great. Uh, but there's many, many other uh, functions in, in, we run a business, right? So there's also uh, HR, there's also marketing, there's also, uh, so it has uh, the, the, the whole breadth of any organization. And with that also a room, a lot of room for other profiles. You know, we tend to think about the portfolio managers or the analysts, but obviously it's much, much more than that. So you've mentioned that progressively you see more diversity within yep. asset management. Ronald, maybe you could share what is like a profile, like a major that someone did that's currently working in asset management that you've met that you said, oh, that's uh, very interesting. I didn't know they, they can add that value to asset management. Well, uh, like Eric said, it, it has changed. Uh, uh, there is diversity. We, we see a lot of cultural diversity, uh, but also more and more background diversity. Uh, answer to your question, we have English literature and we have uh, psychology, for instance, as, as, as backgrounds. Uh, uh, I think recently someone uh, sort of, I'm not sure this is the right term, but theater science or something like that. Uh, so, so those are backgrounds and, and, and there are, depends also what people did after that or how they develop, what kind of skills they show uh, and, and, and and bring to the table. So um, I think it's becoming more diverse. We also work very much uh, uh, towards that, also uh, gender diversity. It's an important attention point. In our junior uh, groups, since uh, many years now, we, uh, we have many female uh, uh, participants. And that when, when I, st uh, in my age group, that was far less so. So that's also a, a, change, a change factor. Uh, 
So I think that's that's what we experience. Yeah. Okay. But still looking at your company website and teams, there is a lot of homogeneity still. Uh, but you make it very clear that uh, you welcome diversity and inclusion overall. At Van Lens van Kemp, uh, your more than 2,000 employees represent 30 nationalities. At APG, you specifically welcome bicultural talent, and you also publicly advertise for uh, groups uh, for women or for uh, LGBT community individuals. How have you seen the workplace change since the introduction of more inclusive policies? So specifically, how, you just how and I would say slow. Uh, so we have seen the workplace change, but we have seen it change slowly, uh, and and this is what tends to happen. And so this not this is although may, one way want to see this is not revolution. So you have seen those factors gradually changing uh, and moving into our workforce. Uh, sometimes for small, when when I go to our Hong Kong office. This is, this is the big melting pot of, of gender, nationalities, uh, and all uh, color, uh, all kinds of things, and, and it's really visible. Uh, but it's also a smaller group. When I enter into our Dutch office and I walk the floors, there's still uh, many elements of uh, 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 male, uh, a, a white of color, uh, uh, a certain studies. Uh, but this is also gradually, gradually changing. So what is some change that you have seen that has been really meaningful that has, so like you have seen that, for example, women get more opportunity to advance qu more quickly in their careers and so on? Berg, something from uh, the last I, I, I think it's already very, very different today than it was five years ago. Um, I also, by the way, echo uh, what Ronald just said. You know, if I look at our UK office, uh, entirely different different setup, you know, with nationalities and backgrounds and you know, so it's also something that we have to solve here in the Netherlands within asset management. Uh, we're both obviously uh, also represented on the board of TUFAS. Um, yeah, so we know uh, that is that is a challenge and it's something that we carry from the past. I mean, it's just the fact that, you know, 10 years ago, if you look at analysts, portfolio managers and particularly in that group, um, yeah, it was only white males and uh, usually wearing blue suits. Um, and obviously, uh, or gray, yeah. or gray. <laughs> uh, and obviously, uh, we are a product of that generation as well, right? So we're not uh, yeah. the best examples, yeah. well. uh, but that's just the way it is. And yeah. the only thing that we can do uh, is to promote a change and to be deliberate about that change. Yeah, it's just difficult to see that then you can identify that there has been a positive change, but not what it exactly comes down to, that what are those solutions that work. Um, but no, we, yeah. we, we, can, we can see the diversity in the teams. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's just an example, but, um, you know, if I now look, for example, at our credit team, uh, which is diverse, it's 50-50, it has different backgrounds. Uh, you know, there's people from South Africa, from all, well, different nationalities. Um, actually, in terms of uh, how comfortable we are with the decision making in that group, we're very comfortable. Uh, and now compare that to uh, a group that has been together for a long, long time, um, and, and you know, they then tend up tend to be friends. It's a very homogeneous group. Um, that's where increasingly we start to worry uh, whether they can also have the uh, agility and the adaptability. Uh, to go with change, like the AI question that was just asked. I mean, is this the group that's going to carry you into the future? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but you need to be increasingly aware that that may be a group for which it's going to be difficult to to, uh, to make that change. Okay, that was yeah, very nice to hear about those experiences. And as we've discussed throughout this uh, interview, both of you manage very large portfolios and uh, they come with big social impacts and changes that you've also already discussed the uh, impact on. In the makeup of your portfolios, you make uh, decisions regarding those social elements. For example, whether you decide to invest in oil or not. How much do these personal, the, do these difficult decisions weigh on you personally? Not. No? No, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do the job, I think. <laughs> it's like uh, what you just said, you know, well, it's, it's so much money, but 
if I think about that, then uh, you may lose sleep over it, right? So I used to think ab about them in terms of matchsticks, you know, still important, uh, but not uh, that every euro that you lose uh, for a client or for yourself uh, will give you a headache or a heartburn. Uh, you wouldn't last very long in this line of business, right? So you need to be able to separate that. Otherwise, uh, you know, this is not a career maybe for you. Um, that is not to say that you don't have to try your utmost best to make the best decision. And then the outcome you have to deal with and you have to accept. Yeah. And uh, well, APG, you have moved uh, away from investing into oil and pump, correct? Is that you, that's completely moved away right now? Sorry. Well, the, uh, the, that is true for ABP pension fund. Uh, so we have other pension fund clients that have now divested fully from uh, fossil fuels, but, uh, but ABP which is by, by size far the largest pension fund has divested, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you reflect on these social changes? On that change or uh, other? Uh, uh, in general. On gen I, 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 there's always, uh, it is uh, a dilemma in a way, uh, because uh, we feel that by, Im as, as I explained earlier, by investing you can influence the route, the course that a sector is going, uh, and by engagement, talking to companies, asking for changes, you can influence that. The moment you divest from a sector, uh, you lose some of that. ABP, by the way, said that we are going to compensate to uh, by having those influence on the demand side. Uh, so the utilities that are using fuels, uh, we can still affect those, and by that we can still influence the source of energy in the world. But it's always a trade-off. Uh, 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 you need to have influence in a certain way, and that sometimes is a dilemma. And then there's, of course, for APG, for the asset management company, there's always the professional boundaries. I explained about diversification. Suppose a one could probably find an individual in the world uh, against every sector or company that exists. So if you would listen to everyone, you could not invest in anything. And of course, you need to have a certain ability to divest, to be broadly invested. So you can't say we're not going to invest in this and this and this. So uh, proper professional diversification, uh, being responsible about the decisions you make, uh, saying, well, we've did, uh, done this because of this, and this is what the result was, that is very important. So I really, I would lose sleep over not, and, and I make mistakes, uh, and uh, if I, so I sometimes during my career said, well, this, pro I've, uh, this was probably less professional, not completely non but less professional, and there I would maybe lose some sleep over uh, because very important for me is strict being the professional making the prudent right decision being able to tell people explain why we have done something uh, you will not lose after some time you are not losing sleep over euros i i do remember uh, the first big trade i did uh, that was uh, only 20 million uh, only 20 million. Uh, only 20 okay. million uh, <laughs> at the time uh, and that night I, I had done this trade and I, I, uh, my dream was I've completely screwed up on this one. I, I mixed up buy and sell and yeah, that, but that was the only time during my career that, that this particular, uh, the, the euros were, were a factor. After that uh, it becomes normal and you get used to larger sums of money. Uh, but yes, your uh, professional integrity, that's something that remains and is very crucial. And that, of course, we do what, our, what the asset owners tell us to do, uh, and that's important, that the client decides, but there's limits and, and your professional responsibility are those limits. So I would actually like to zoom in, you say you listen to your clients, sometimes you have dilemmas, trade-offs. I, I truly wonder, are you guys maybe a bit envious of each other, considering that you have different clients when it comes to like your trading style, like investment style, where you kind of look at the other person and say, oh, if it was up to me, I'd have different clients, I'd probably invest into that. Are you a bit envious of each other? Yes. 
because I've so I always am, am, uh, we have had this this question before. I think I'm I'm always envious of the entrepreneurial spirit at at uh, uh, Van uh, Kempen. Uh, we are a sort of a we are large at APG. Think well about certain things. Take our time. Sometimes oh, we're in it for the long run. So our decision uh, that we can have sort of can have all that, but but we are not always uh, fast on our feet, moving quickly, uh, responding very fast to new clients, new segments, changing our, our course. That I'm sometimes envious of. Uh, that Eric uh, is far more uh, entrepreneurial in his approach uh, yeah. with his team. Yeah, the part that I'm envious of uh, is that uh, when when APG uh, makes a statement, people listen. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, <laughs> that is something that we have to fight for every day. But uh, it's it's an organization that is really really well respected around the world. Uh, you may not uh, necessarily know that, uh, but it's one of the leaders in the space, and yeah. definitely when it comes to sustainability and impact investing, um, and that's a, that's a big big tribute uh, to what they've done over the last uh, ten years to establish a profile like that for for a Dutch organization. So. That's what my answer would be. <laughs> so uh, let's see. You both mentioned how companies are quite aware of sustainability, especially APG. Well, um, maybe that's a bit unfair, but I've read your report mm, and I'm uh, yeah. very, very impressed. Sustainability is really <coughs> a main emphasis. But I wonder, has it always been like this? Like, how was it 30 years ago? Like, what, 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 was, what was sustainability uh, in asset management 30 years ago or 20 years ago? It has not always been like that. Uh, and uh, I remember, uh, so it was also not uh, APG or ABP starting it in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, before APG, I worked at Robico. And I, was, I managed one of the first, but not the first, but one of the first sustainability funds in the Netherlands. Uh, it sta that started, I think, the early 90s of the previous century, where, where it uh, entered into uh, many asset uh, managers, but it was sort of a niche. Uh, when it was brought to, to uh, funds like ABP, it really grew into something big. Uh, it changed uh, appearance a bit. Uh, it w got further... Uh, Refined, modified, I improved, supported by by better data. So that has been a, a, a big change. But I think APG ABP went on that route probably since the beginning of of this century, so roughly 2000 onwards. So it's been there for quite some time. But I, I, I can really see you smiling when you when you speak about this. Yeah. Say like a century ago, uh, yeah. at the start of the century, we started this year. Yeah. A, so yeah. it's yeah. very. Uh, it's also. I care about that a lot. Yeah. So I I think I, I, uh, everyone's role is modest, but I think I've been able to play a little role in it. In it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think this would be a good time to take a couple more audience questions yeah. before wrapping up the interview. Do we have some more questions? Anybody that hasn't asked yet? So I see a person in the back. Sorry, this is a callback to a question, uh, something you mentioned quite a while ago. You said that the risk in the private markets is rapidly decreasing. I know that a lot of asset management firms like PGM are increasingly looking to increase their investments in private markets. Uh, do you think that will mean a large capital outflow out of uh, just the normal exchanges? And uh, what, what would this mean for retail investors? Because we don't have access to those markets. Well, I uh, maybe you will will get it. maybe you'll get it uh, because the uh, largest asset manager in the world, amongst many others, want to uh, make it available for uh, for retail. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was visiting Larry Fink. And he really is thinking about we managed to make this accessible for uh, private for 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 retail. There are some challenges though, uh, and I've experienced some of those challenges when 
I mean, I, I, I talked about my career at the beginning at, at Rubico. We also tried to make private equity available for retail at that time, and that turned out to be very difficult. Uh, so there's not uh, always uh, uh, daily, uh, of course, you're invested for the long run, so there's not daily availability of those assets. If people that have invested want to buy a dishwasher instead of being invested, uh, that uh, 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 fund is starting to trade at a discount. Uh, people get worried about that discount and starting to sell, and the discount becomes bigger and bigger. And only if you wait until maturity, you escape uh, a, a big loss. That's one of the uh, difficulties. But but I, there, I, I'm not sure the risk is decreasing, but I do know that many of the largest companies and asset managers in the world are exploring how can we make private markets accessible to the mass as well. I always say we make private markets uh, uh, accessible to the mass, the pensioners in the Netherlands or the people that are building up, because they are all together investing uh, in those markets as well by building up the pension. So that's, that's our contribution to it, I think. There's so much going on uh, behind the scenes uh, that you have not seen and that maybe we have seen a little bit of. Uh, so this is coming, uh, no doubt, uh, and it's coming fast. Um, the part that, and by the way, at Philanthropy Camper, we play that game as well. Um, and so we're just about to launch the third private equity fund. Um, and this is the third year that we're doing that. So there's also apparently a lot of appetite, and there should be for private markets. The thing uh, that is concerning to me, and I don't know yet uh, where that will lead me or the organization, um, is that inevitably this will lead to disappointment. Um, you know, usually um, if you have a, um, a, a, a private markets fund somehow defined, uh, you're thinking about an investment that may take you in a horizon of five to 10 years, right? You don't know what the outcome is. You will have to wait for five to 10 years. The information is not entirely as transparent as what we have with, for example, uh, the listed securities. And there's one thing that we already know, um, and that is that in the spectrum of managers, um, if you look at managers that uh, manage listed equities, the dispersion between the last, uh, the bottom quartile and the top quartile is significant but it's overseeable. The dispersion in private markets between the top and the bottom quartile is gigantic. So the art of being with the right manager becomes something of a challenge in itself. Um, so you have to be with the right manager, but you also, more importantly than that, have to avoid being in the fourth quartile because that's really gonna hurt you in your returns. They're negative by definition. Uh, um, and for this to play out, you know, it has the characteristics of kind of a baked in disappointment. So I don't know how we're gonna deal with that, but I mean, we have to be very, very mindful. So what's the next question here in the middle? Um, yeah, I have a question for Erik. Um, so we heard APG or um, Ronald uh, talk a lot about sustainability um, and the importance for APG for that. How does it uh, how does it entail in uh, Van Lans Um What is the importance of sustainability for your investment, and how do you see that changing yeah. over the next few years? Like I said, you know, I, I consider uh, Ronald APG ABP uh, as one of the the leaders in the space. Uh, we're we're not. Uh, we're also not electric, by the way. Uh, you know, I think we do uh, we do more than our fair share. Where the difference is, is that, um, and this is not without boundaries, not for Ronald either, but, um, you know, I, if a client tells me, you know, I, I'm not interested in impact, uh, am I going to be in a position then to nudge him or to convince him to go into impact investing? It's just not going to happen that way, right? Um, and I may, over time, uh, you know, get him into something that is more responsible or more sustainable. Um, and we do see that uh, as also a kind of a fiduciary duty that we have as an organization. 
you know, to advertise, uh, but I cannot force a client to go into a profile that he doesn't believe in. As a result, for an organization like Van Landschot Kemper, it would be impossible to get out of oil and gas industry. By the way, my personal opinion is also not to get out of oil and gas, uh, but to be part of the transition that needs to take place in the oil and gas industry, i.e., uh, you know, invest in the best in the oil and gas industry. And uh, you know, those companies that are most progressive uh, and spend you know, a considerable time and energy also to make the transition for their organization, uh, so that they're also around 10 or 20 years from now. Um, and so the fact that we have a different client base also dictates uh, that there is a different strategy when it comes to, sust to sustainability. That's not to say, uh, again, that we don't find it important to have, uh, and we do think that we have a responsibility uh, to, to investigate with clients, you know, what the opportunity set is and, uh, yeah, to basically nudge them. I don't really like that word because it's like, you know, I'm telling you what to do, uh, but at least to make them aware uh, about what the possibilities are. My experience is that if you have that kind of a dialogue with clients, then almost automatically they are interested in, uh, you know, next to the return and the risk profile also for investments to have some kind of an addition, additional component, you know, that you may call impact or, you know, whatever, whatever word, because it's, it's, it's latent. Uh, but, you know, most of our clients are what I would call light green. So you kind of have to have that dialogue with them, not necessarily dark green, because otherwise they would have been probably clients of Triodos or, you know, somebody else. So Eric, if I, if I may ask uh, yeah. very briefly, so a client comes to you and you say, Look, sustainability, we have a, a very nice portfolio, you can invest into these assets. What, why do they say no? Do they, are they just looking for returns? Because Ronald, uh, he shows that you can actually invest a lot of the money into sustainable assets. It does work. Do your clients just don't believe in it? Do they think that the profit is not, or the rendement is not too high? Like, what is the reason why they don't want to jump on something more sustainable? Our clients are a reflection of society. Um, and, um, you know, so that means that, um, you know, and, and it's not 50-50, you know, I mean, I think a much, much larger percentage, um, if you do engage them, is interested in, uh, you know, a, a portfolio with the sustainable characteristics. And by the way, you know, in all of the portfolios that we manage, we use certain thresholds. Uh, so it's not like, well, you invest, you want to invest in tar sands. Uh, let's invest in tar sets. You know, we don't invest in tar sets because we don't think it makes, uh, you know, a lot of sense. I mean, that's at the bottom. You know, so we filter out the bottom. Uh, so that's why we call that's why we call it the responsible portfolio. That's what it starts with, and then you move on to sustainable, and then you move on to uh, to impact. Um, but if if there's clients that that you know really don't believe um, uh, that we should step out of uh, oil and gas, then uh, you know there's an argument to to be made. And also at, uh, at AP, uh, APG, ABP, this is a discussion that has taken years for APB to come to that conclusion. You know, I've even been part of uh, some of that. So uh, all I'm saying is that, um, you know, it's a very different story, at least that's my belief, uh, to make a journey with a client and to inform him uh, on, uh, what the, or her, uh, on what the possibilities are than to say, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't have a solution for you because I don't agree with where you're coming from. That's very fair. <coughs> do, we, do we have one more question from the audience? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are the topics you clash uh, most about with uh, regulators? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun question, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Regulators, I understand, but what, what is the what is one of the most uh, the clashes with the regulators? Oh, clash. Yeah. Uh, are there so many that you're thinking about here, or are you picking your favourite one? Uh, I, th I think the <coughs> the risk aversion, uh, everything related to uh, prudency. Uh, I think we regulators tend to, and that's their role, eh, but but probably are over-concerned and they want to be, uh, be demonstrable in control for everything uh, and that we tend to think sometimes too much. Uh, so sometimes proving everything is not in 
not not possible. Uh, though we realize that, that you need to be able to show why you're doing certain things. But I think the clash is probably about the extent to which you are able to to show that you're doing things and that you've taken out all the risk. And uh, why is that? Because we know that the uh, uh, main ingredient for investment returns is taking risk. Uh, and and, and uh, one of my predecessors at, uh, at APG had his T-shirts, uh, we love risk. And then on, the ba on his back he had, because we can handle it. And that I really believe in. Huh? So in a way we love risk because you, you, need to, uh, you can deal with it. Uh, and that is, sometimes, that, that is sometimes missing at the regulators. I think that's sort of the reason that there's lots of debate, though I very much find it important that we have regulators. I respect their role, but they sometimes take it a bit too far. Yeah, maybe two things uh, to add. Um, you know, the, the amount of regulation, uh, you know, that is continued to be pushed out on the market is such that it really starts to interfere or has started to interfere uh, with, you know, the way that we are organized or the costs associated with it. Um, and, you know, that's particularly true in the Netherlands because everything that comes out of for example, European legislation, and obviously that's more and more, tends to be then also even gold-plated for the Dutch market. So it gets translated into some things that are uh, really specific. Uh, that's one of the areas of concern and also dialogue. Uh, yeah, because on the one hand, um, you know, obviously uh, having legislation is good. You know, I will never argue against that. Uh, but to find the right balance, um, you know, it seems like Sometimes we're a little bit on uh, on the other end, and with that also the ability uh, to basically operate uh, a company. Because you know, uh, if you're on a leash and you have uh, very very little room, room to maneuver, well, how are you going to end up, and how are you going to drive your business? I mean, it becomes very very burdensome. So there there are points of attention there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much to the audience for the questions. You can continue asking them in Cafe Crater very soon. Um, I'd like to turn to you for a final question. Um, you've both had very successful careers and reached wonderful positions in finance. We would appreciate some words of advice. What is the biggest challenge you have had and the biggest lesson you have learned? I will give you a moment to think. Mm. Mm. Uh, in, in our mm. careers or in life. <laughs> I think it would be helpful if it careers. were to be about asset management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then. You have something in mind? Mm. The biggest yeah. challenge. Biggest challenge and lesson. Yeah. Has it been such an easy lot that nothing is coming <laughs> up? Or no, 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 no. Let, let me let me let me talk about the biggest challenge. I mean, the biggest challenges in uh, kind of a thirty-year uh, career, uh, and from that from that uh, angle, you know, the question that you asked earlier on: uh, Are we getting a recession? Um, you know, when the market really, really tanks. I mean, those are the most difficult weeks, days, weeks, months um, uh, for, uh, well, for me personally, but also for any organization and our clients. It's like the whole world is in turmoil, right? And you need to find a new balance uh, and you need to make some sense uh, of what is, is, is happening. 9-11 is so one of those moments that we all remember uh, where we were at that point of time. Uh, but we knew immediately what the effect of that uh, would be um, and how you how you deal with that, uh, how you communicate with your clients. I mean, that's like a, it creates a crisis moment. Um, and, you know, there have been maybe in my career four or five, uh, uh, but then it's all, uh, I mean, uh, it's no vacation then, eh, right? Uh, everybody needs to come to work uh, and we go into a crisis mode. By the way, um, make no mistake, we train that. Uh, because it's not like we're not that naive, like, okay, if that moment comes, it's always at a time where you don't expect it. Um, you need to be ready and you need to train those muscles as well. So, um, you know, I think it's a significant part of what we do as an organization to get ready for those situations. You practice, uh, you come up with different scenarios, uh, you go into, into kind of an overdrive. Um, so that's one. In terms of advice, 
Um, yeah, I think one of the things that that I've always done is, you know, change position, change your perspective, change your challenge every couple of years. That doesn't mean that you necessarily go to a different company. I mean, it's possible that that's within, uh, uh, you know, a organization for a number of times. But I mean, you, you need to continue to look in the mirror and say, am I still challenging myself? Am I still developing as an individual? Um, and, um, you know, I think if, if you do that, you know, your path will will lead you to yeah, a certain position. Um. Yeah, and Donald, well, I, I would think that uh, challenge is always mobilizing uh, your people. I think that, 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 with that uh, there's always the trade-off between how are we going to able to, to execute things and taking everyone along. And that's this continuous balance. Uh, so you need to uh, be able to execute, but you also need to respect uh, people and take them on the route. And that's for uh, a manager in whatever position you 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 are, always the, the great challenge you need to deal with. Uh, and lesson is, I think, uh, be careful for uh, group think and that's that's similar to Eric's advice uh, so there's there's all all too soon you think that you have taken everything into account uh, and there's no room for the dissenting opinion not only in the room but also in your in your own hat and uh, you've and and you would be uh, I think you told me and I I promise I'm not I'm not going to interview uh, you, but that you are amazed about how much information you gain by asking questions. And if we are not careful in our roles, we only talk about what we feel uh, and are not asking sufficient questions. And by not asking sufficient questions, we are not finding everything out. And only question asking is probably also not enough because there's always views that you would not hear and and then I go back to mobilize how are you able to get all those information out of uh, the wisdom that is all around you but it's very hard to to be harvested and that could also be your lesson for for life I think huh? find ways to harvest that wisdom that's around you so look at the, at the bottle that came out there um, Ronald might start asking you questions as well I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes yeah. And uh, on this note, I would like to thank everyone for coming to this interview. We will be continue, uh, continue talking about finance because we have Klaas Knoth coming on Thursday, on the 7th of November at 1 o'clock instead of at 4. Uh, so please keep an eye on Instagram for you know, upcoming interviews. And we will all see you at the bottle. Uh, the bottle is at Criterion, if I'm correct. Krater. Krater, I always mix them up. The bottle is at Krater. Uh, and you can maybe ask a question to Ronald or Eric uh, there as well. A big uh, applause.